Great. So, uh, welcome everybody. It's great to see almost 300 people in attendance on the webinar. My name, uh, as some of you might know, is Jonathan Yarconi. I come from a background in software engineering around 15 years in the industry. Previously, I spent six years at Google uh, as an AI and ML specialist. And recently, in the past four months, uh, I founded an AI consulting company called Shujin, where we've been taking projects across the spectrum from classical ML to generative AI to ML ops. And we've done quite a few projects around uh, prompt engineering. And we thought it'd be a very interesting topic uh, to come and talk in the community. A bit of the agenda. Demos, demos, demos. We got quite a, little, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of demos. I hope to be able to cover them all. Uh, we'll focus on techniques going from basic to advanced to concepts. Uh, third, we'll be discussing the prompt engineering process uh, throughout hands-on examples that I'll show throughout. Uh, and we'll also discuss how the process itself looks step by step. And we'll finish up by discussing papers and resources, what you can read, where you should find it, and how to learn more. Just to level the playing field, uh, we're discussing prompt engineering, which is the skill of effectively crafting prompts. If you look at the left, you can see that we have a prompt. Uh, and a prompt, when we hit enter in ChatGPT, can give us several different re responses. And if any of you have tried this in the past, you know that the responses uh, are not necessarily consistent. The models are not deterministic. Um, and we won't go into the theory, but technically, a prompt can end up in many different places. It's your guide through prompt engineering to guide the model into giving you uh, the correct response or the response that you're looking for. If I should give you just a mental model about how to be thinking about this, I think that you're speaking to a toddler who is rather fluent in English, but still has very unexpected behavior. Um, it's your job to slowly guide the toddler uh, by giving him all kinds of things that we'll discuss and sparking his, his memory, okay? Prompt engineering seems to have this illusion of ease. This is what I want to teach you today, how to go from what's on the left to what's on the right. If to give you just a preview of the demo we'll be going up through at the end, it looks something like this. On the left, you can see a legend of color-coded things, which um, I will explain them as we go through the lecture. On the right, you can see the prompt that created the very good mail that you saw just previously. And you can see the different things such as examples and tones and titles, all color coded. You don't have to understand what everything means right now. We'll go over this uh, together. So the basics, we have task. A task is what you want the model to do. It can be anything from summarize, analyze, blog post, uh, write me a, an essay or a cold email that I showed you before. Uh, the second thing is the context. This is really a crucial part. Uh, most of the guidance of the model happens uh, through additional context. context. Sparking the memory of a, of a model is also done through the context. And normally, the more context we give, the better uh, the output will perform. Next, we have a role. A role is when you tell the model to act as something. It can be a mathematician, it can be a philosopher, it can be a historian. We don't do this just for the purpose of styling. If to give you an example, which I use on one of the demos at the end, there I tell the model, act as a mathematician. Now, I'm not doing it in order for it to run write fancy formulas and stuff like that. I'm trying to trigger a more analytical approach in the generation of the output. If I would uh, tell it, uh, act as a philosopher, it might uh, use more, um, more concepts from philosophy when trying to interpret uh, the prompt. Next, we have formatting. This can be anything from bullet points, uh, essay style to a uh, poem style. Uh, tone, uh, pretty self-explanatory. I can tell it which tone you use. It can be formal, informal. It can be uh, domain-specific, such as legal. And it can also... Uh, 
mimic the style of a famous person such as JK Rowling or Steve Jobs. Uh, last one is uh, constraints, and this is basically setting the boundaries for the model. Great, we've reached the advanced. Uh, there are a lot of papers on the topic of prompt engineering. I have tried to curate a few which I think are more interesting. Uh, you can see the list of them here going from chain of thought all the way to reverse prompting. Since we don't have a lot of time together today, I've selected a few, which I'll go over now. Chain of thought may be one of the most famous and influential papers of prompt engineering. As some of you might be familiar and anybody who's joined the meetup we had two weeks ago, the whole progress of generative AI is constantly uh, viewed through the lens of benchmarking. We get a new model or a new version of the model. Uh, somebody, maybe the company itself or uh, people from the open source community, take that model and they benchmark it. Uh, every new paper that is released is, uh, is being judged according to those benchmarks. Chain of Thought is a paper uh, that display the following capability. When you ask the model, and you can see an example here on the left, uh, Roger has five tennis balls. He buy two more cans of tennis ball. Uh, each can have three. How many tennis balls does he have? Uh, and the answer is 11. You ask another very similar question, uh, cafeteria, so on and so forth. And he gives the answer is 27, which is the wrong answer. Okay. Um, when you use chain of thought, you do one of two things. On the right, you can see the same exact prompt, only instead of saying the answer is 11, the answer still remains 11, but only I give him the steps in order to reach that solution. I say Roger started with five balls, two cans uh, of three tennis balls. Each is six tennis balls. Five plus six is 11. Now, when I ask the exact same question of the same format, he actually gets the answer right. Why? Because he's trying to emulate my process. And I think some of the benchmark improve 34% when they use chain of thought. Now, this is the robust way to use chain of thought when you actually detail the entire entirety of the chain of thought. But there's also a trick to use it where you simply say, let's think step by step. And sometimes it's also able to do that. This is a relatively easy example, but when your prompts get really complicated, it's not always easy to go and give an example of the step-by-step, -step, and you might not always know the actual steps required for solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where the second option really comes into hand. Okay, here are three different papers, all which are post-query model enhancement. Starting from the top right, we have knowledge generation. Let's say I have a question I want to ask the model. Uh, asking the model the question straight up doesn't always yield the best result. What this paper showed is that if you, before asking the actual question, ask the model to generate some knowledge based on the topics from the question and then append those topics with the question itself, you get better performance. The second paper on the bottom right is similar. Here, you ask the model prior to querying it to give you a hint based on the topic. This is very akin to what I said before, the mental model where you're trying to spark the toddler's imagination. So you're giving them a hint or you're giving rather the model a hint of what information he should try and tap into. The third similar and most recent paper uh, is about step, uh, step back and abstraction. This is a two-step process. Uh, I'll give, you, I'll give you the example that's written here. We asked the original question is some kind of physics question, which requires you to understand a few concepts in physics. So the step back question is, what are the physics principles behind this question? And now when we actually ask the question with the uh, abstraction, it's able to understand that it should probably go figure out those concepts and make use of them when answering the question. Uh, the full paper details uh, exactly how much better it is over chain of thought, which is one of the best methods so far. So you can see chain of thought in yellow, and you can see step back prompting in green. Uh, both of them, I think, are papers by Google. Step back prompting has really um, 
Excel. Great. And now I'm showing all these examples, not necessarily that every time you write a prompt, you'll go and you'll have a checklist and you'll go over the checklist and you'll go, oh, I put in chain of uh, thought and I've uh, addressed the uh, knowledge generation and I've implemented emotional stimuli. No, I go over this, these so that you will get a sense of what works and what doesn't work. And then you'll be able to have a better intuitive feeling as you're going through the process of prompt engineering. Most of the time, you won't be using all of the concepts. You'll see when I show you uh, some of the demos in a moment, it, I won't be using all of these all the time. It's rather cumbersome and not all of them are always effective. I'm continuing. Emotional stimuli, a very interesting paper, which kind of drives home the point of maybe talking to a toddler. Emotional stimuli uh, show that if you simply append at the end of a prompt something which appeals to the emotional side of the model, uh, granted that you think it has an emotional side, it, it performs better. Uh, they've shown that prompts, and I think they have uh, almost 15 prompts in the paper itself, Prompts like my job depends on it or take pride in your work and give it your best, which appeal to like the self-monitoring part of that. Uh, I see that we have a, a, a poll here. So um, if you could just take a moment and kind of uh, fill in the poll, discussing briefly like what is your experience with prompt engineering? If you're a non-tech function with experience or an expert, or if you are a tech function uh, with experience, that would be great. So give it just the, I will give it just like 10, 15 more seconds, fill in the, the, uh, the prompt itself. And then I'll continue on reviewing the following papers. Great, great. Almost 300 people take some time to, uh, to answer all of these uh, polls. Great. Okay, let me continue. So just to recap, emotional stimuli, very interesting paper. They found 13 prompts which appeal to the uh, emotional side of a model, such as self-monitoring and social cognitive um, um, side. It's, again, been shown to improve. And similar to the second option of a chain of thought, it's really easy to implement. You'll see this when I show the cold email example, where at the end I tell them, you know, my career really depends on you getting this right. Self-consistency. Self-consistency is very intuitive. It simply means that you'll be querying the model several times. As you can see, the model here on the right has been queried three times, two out of those three times. It says $18. So uh, when polling this together, uh, the answer that was most common is the $18. And it just so happens to be the right answer. Uh, we're using the greedy simply uh, flat out, asking the question, got it wrong. Okay. Another one is um, recursive criticism and improvement. Now we're stepping into methods that you should use always, okay? At least until you reach a higher level of expertise in prompt engineering. Recursive criticism and improvement, despite its uh, daunting name, is simply using the model, asking it to critique your prompt, and then taking that critique into account. You can either tell the model to put the critique into the new prompt, or you can read what it thinks and uh, do it yourself. Reverse prompt engineering. This is, as the name implies, starting from the end result. You may have an example of a very good mail that you or a colleague or taking my example have written, but you don't exactly know what prompt could generate uh, such an email because maybe you want to generate many more emails like that or you want to have a template of a cold email where you can just 
plug and play and change things like the product catalog or the seasonality, let's say when Christmas uh, comes up, as was just the case now. You give ChatGPT in this uh, instance, you give him a actual output of a prompt and you ask ChatGPT to give you the prompt that can generate uh, such an output. This again is a very good method for anybody starting out because it's really easy to miss or have a lot of blind spots when trying to prompt engineer. If you can recall what I showed in the beginning, the legend of like different color coded things I put into the email, that wasn't even an exhaustive list. You'll see more when we talk about concepts in a couple of slides. Um, so this is hands down the first method that I recommend anybody start with. Prompt revision, very intuitive. You just give the prompt at the stage you're at, ask ChatGPT to make it better. If anything, it helps organize. When you're really going down a rabbit hole in prompt engineering and you're working on a prompt, let's say I have an example here at the end, a guard allocation problem. It's a prompt that's very, very hard to solve. I first of all recommend each of you try it. And second of all, it took me around an hour to get the model to give me an answer which is actually correct. Um, I use this method. Why do I use this method? Because you keep on subtracting and adding stuff and changing things and so on and so forth. And it gets messy. It gets messy, if, even if you're an organized person. And at the least, ChatGPT will help make things more organized. And if you've been following along, the models appreciate organization. Okay, We'll see this at the end where I even put line delimiters between different parts of like the task and the context and so on and so forth. Great. Let us jump into a demo. Now, I'm just going to run all of these cells. Let's start from a basic example. Okay. I just want to show you how a very basic prompt would look. Um, I am just going to utilize task, format, role, and tone. Wanted to remind you here of the color-coded legend, and this is the prompt that we'll be using. I am telling the um, model, you are a scholar historian. Your task is to summarize any given text in five bullet points with a sense of urgency. So here I'm using, I'm using role. I'm telling it, you're an historian. I'm telling it what a task it is about to perform. Okay, you can see that in kind of an orangish color. Uh, I'm telling it the format in which I want it to be. I want it to be in five bullet points. And I'm also giving a tone, sense of urgency. Technically, I don't have to really give anything other than the task. If I don't give the task, I'll just be having a, a mute conversation with the model itself. Uh, but here I've utilized four different concepts to give you a very basic example. And if I run this, I'm using OpenAI. Uh, the default model which I'm using is a GPT 3.5 Turbo. And I'm simply giving it here a very long text of World War II. Great. Moving on to advanced methods. So I've only selected a few. Again, we don't have uh, the entirety of the day to, to spend reviewing every every different uh, type of technique. Um, great. Chain of thought. You see here um, two cells. The first one is without chain of thought. I'm simply giving it a math problem, uh, telling it which is the faster way to get the work. There's option one, and then there's option two. And when I run this cell, it will say option one. Option one is not the correct answer. Let's not do the calculation now, but anybody who wants to do back of the envelope on their own. Um, um, if we actually give it um, a chain of thought, so here, I'm saying the same way thing again, which is the faster way to get home? Um, and I'm saying option one will take 60 minutes, giving the calculation, option two will give 100. Since option one takes 60 minutes and the other, so on and so forth. And then I'm giving it uh, another different question after having given, you know, an example. 
Great. And not another different question. I'm giving the same question again. Sorry. This was a different question. And this is obviously the same question I'm trying to compare. And this time it gets it right. It also details uh, how it did the calculation. Uh, trust me, option two is right. Option one is not the correct. Here is an example of generated knowledge. Um, here, as you, anybody who has a keen eye will see that I switched the model. These models work on very, very large uh, prompts. If anybody has been following right now, uh, OpenAI GPT 4V is at 128,000 to uh, tokens. Claude from Anthropic is at 200,000 tokens. Uh, and we're using maybe in the prompts that I've shown you, the previous one I think is maybe 150 tokens, not even scratching the limit. You need to understand that uh, 200,000 tokens is around 1,500 pages. Um, sorry, around 500 pages. The entirety of the Bible is around 1,000 pages. Uh, I think it's 1,543 or something, according to my last Google search. It's kind of hard to, to demonstrate uh, some of the easier concepts uh, using a very strong model. Uh, but when you scale the prompts, these behaviors start to re-exhibit. Um, for the sake of, uh, of um, readability, I'm showing here at a much simpler model. So here, uh, I use it, uh, part of golf, I asked it the following question, sorry. Part of golf is trying to get a higher a point total uh, than others. And I asked yes or no. Anybody who's familiar with golf, and uh, ironically, I'm not very familiar with golf, but it's not as the same as basketball or football where you're just trying to get a higher score. Uh, there's all these games with par and under par and so forth and so on. So when I asked the model initially, it says, Yes. Um, and when I ask the same question again, but I also give it some prior knowledge, which I generated by asking a different model, I ask it and it says, no, the objective of golf is not to get a higher point. So this, again, demonstrating how when I straight up ask the model, it doesn't know. Uh, when I give it more information, and I promise you the information was not, uh, by the way, the objective of golf is not to get a higher score. No, the the information that I added was some information about how the game of golf actually works. You play rounds and each time you strike the ball and so on and so forth and you get points. And it's not, it's not that I cued him into the answer. I just gave him an understanding of how the game works. Next example is self-consistency. Self-consistency is a bit hard to... Uh, showcase. So I just did an example here with ChatGPT, which I, I also think is, it shows two things. First of all, I'm not getting the same answer every time, and I'm using the exact same prompt with the same exact model. It showcases the these models are not deterministic. And to some extent, even though they're not deterministic, they do have um, a good uh, knowledge because they compress all of the data on the internet. Here you can see I only tried the same prompt three times and two out of three times it says yes. And it just so happens to be that the actual answer to this question is yes rather than no. A very basic example of how you would utilize self-consistency. You can obviously create a small script of code to run the same prompt several times and extract a, a yes or no and, and, and poll it accordingly. Great. Let us go back into the deck. Okay. Now we will be going over some concepts. These are not specifically things that will be going into the prompt, but they are definitely things that you have to think about when you're doing the process of prompt engineering. So, I'll just re briefly review them and give a couple of examples on the different ones. Uh, be specific. Uh, don't use ambiguous uh, language or concepts. And if you do so use something that it's left up for interpretation, um, explain it. Remove fluff. We've talked about we've talked about the 
method of asking ChatGPT to revise your prompt. Uh, do it yourself. Let ChatGPT do it. If you let ChatGPT do it, definitely monitor the output that you got from it. Uh, another cool trick, which I, I don't discuss, but we do discuss in some of our workshops, is you can ask ChatGPT to uh, put in bold any changes that is made. It's not exactly Microsoft Word track changes, but it's a very effective method to understand what might have changed from the last time. Explain, explain, explain. You'll see this in my later demo where I asked it to divide the workload equally between the different guards. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't understand in the context of the problem what equality means. Only after I explain dividing the shift equally means that no guard has more than one shift uh, added on top of any other guard, does it get it right? Prioritization, you know, prioritize the, the tasks. There's this whole uh, concept of lost in the middle, which we'll see uh, very soon when we discuss papers. Don't be negative. The models don't really handle instructions that are, such as don't do this or don't talk about that topic. Be positive. They much rather be told what to do than being told what not to do. Uh, separators for clarity. Uh, recency bias is a very big thing. Um, as I said, prompts can get very, very long. When we work with companies, it's not normally on two, three liner prompts. It's very, very long prompts, utilizing all of the context window, uh, trying to figure out how we can make the prompt more effective so that we actually have more examples so that it fits into one run one request before we have to go into you know pipelining or breaking it up into several requests. It turns out that there's a thing called recency bias where it, the model tends to pay more attention to things that come towards the end of the prompt. And there's another paper about lost in the middle where they showed that the model actually pays attention more to stuff that comes either at the beginning or at the end. But be be reminded, this only applies to very, very long prompts. Another thing I want to mention, some of the techniques that we've discussed here, such as a chain of thought, they don't work for the very small models. If you're using a Zephyr or Mixtral 7B or Falcon 7B, which is 7 billion parameters, the, the models which weigh around four gigabytes, they won't necessarily exhibit all of these capabilities. Uh, all of these papers have been tested on the very, very large models. Some additional concepts are negating bias. Um, a very interesting example is, uh, I don't know if it still works with ChatGPT, but if you ask uh, certain models the following question, um, uh, Jacob and Daniela both work at a hospital. What do each of them do? Unfortunately, uh, some models will still have bias in them and they'll say Jacob is a doctor and Daniela uh, is a nurse. Uh, so be aware of this, whether it's bias that comes with the model, whether it's bias that you might be bringing into the prompt. Uh, be aware of hallucinations. And uh, this is a topic widely discussed. Uh, I won't go into this more. This is a problem. Uh, how to get more examples. Examples are really important. Um, when Gemini was released last week, uh, it 30 out of 32 uh, benchmarks it actually uh, beat GPT-4. Microsoft, I think it was yesterday, released a paper where they were able to use GPT-4 uh, and beat Gemini. H how is this possible? Nothing has changed. You know, uh, It was the same GPT-4 uh, GPT when Gemini released and it was the same GPT-4 uh, that Microsoft used. They both changed around the number of examples, which is, first of all, to say that they weren't necessarily using apples to apples in those comparisons, uh, which is still being debated. And second of all, examples are really important. If you don't use any, a lot of times you won't get the right answers. If you use 10 or if you use 200, you'll also be getting different results. So you too should be using examples. One very good way to get those examples other than manually crafting them is 
to have a stronger model such as GPT-4 uh, create them for you. Very good way. You say, here's an example, create me other similar yet different examples. And then you can go use them either when you're using ChatGPT with a different context, or you can go use them when you're using a weaker, uh, cheaper, easier to run on your own computer or somewhere else model. Uh, chattiness versus being uh, succinct. A lot of the times you might want the model to just answer with a yes or no. Um, maybe because it's uh, you know it's too chatty. It's giving you a very long answer and you really just care if, if, uh, if the answer is yes or no. Um, there are trade-offs to this. Uh, we discussed this more at length in our workshop. Um, yes, you sometimes want yes or no because you just want to be able to work with the answer. Let's say you're trying to do self-consistency. So you might just want to either get a yes or a no and be able to uh, pull them up and see, you know, two times yes, one time no. But know that it can also sometimes hurt performance. The model, the way that they work, I won't go into this now with probabilities, predicting the next token, looking at all of the tokens that has come have come prior. If you don't let it kind of explore, it might not reach the right answer. Last uh, concept which I use is telling the model how to engage. You'll see this when I show the cold email example. Here, I am um, telling it to ask me questions uh, when it doesn't have all the information needed. Great. So this is a demo of the guard placement, which I spoke about. Uh, I show this because it's a very uh, hard example. I urge you to take the, the problem that I'm showcasing here and try to solve it on your own. As I mentioned before, it, it took me nearly an hour to get this uh, working. And I had to use a very specific model. So the problem, you get a list of people, including their professions. You need to assign them to guarding posts based on different constraints. How does a bad solution look? Where, where did I start out? I started out writing the following prompt saying you have 10 people, the last three have driving license, they need to stand guard. It is your job to build a three-day schedule where the work is divided equally between people. There are two posts which need to be guarded. Gate one should have one person from six to 10 and two people from 10 to six at night. Hassam should have two people and one person at least should, be, uh, should have a driving license. Hassam is only guarded only during the day from six in the morning until six. Eh? Build a three-day schedule. Uh, that did not work at all. I got a very bad response. It did not heed the hours. It did not put the people with the license where they needed to be. It did not get right who had licenses. Uh, it put the same person on uh, different posts at the same time. And it also made up a third post of its own. How does a good solution look? This was my final solution. Uh, here I'm using things I told you before, such as telling it, you're a mathematician. Why? Because I'm trying to trigger to elicit the model to uh, use an analytical approach. Okay, Everything I do here is by design. When we work with people, uh, we do a step-by-step -step process taking a couple of hours in order to showcase the process and make you understand that every everything you write in a prompt, even if you're unaware of it, will affect the model. It might affect it in a good way, it might affect it in a bad way, but it will affect it. So I say, you're a calculated mathematician, you're, you meticulously plan every step of the way. And I start detailing the constraints and the guidelines. I say, you have 10 people, person uh, one through 10 uh, should be allocated to guarding posts. I explain what guarding uh, posts are and what the duration of the shift. Notice that I'm I'm being very um, you know organized here. I'm I'm giving things in bullet points. I'm giving the name at the beginning. I'm putting the shifts uh, at the end. I want the model to be able to to put these things together to take them into relation together. I keep on detailing information about the personnel and, and how the shifts are uh, um, uh, happening and. Um, the requirements for the different posts and some restrictions that I have. Then I go and I give it the output format. 
And this was just something that, you know, I typed up. I said the final schedule, something like this, shift. And, and then I got like, sort of like, you know, tired. I just said, you know, person one, one, person two, two, person three, three. And hoping that the model would understand that I'm, I just want to, you know, I wanted to in the output to give me how many shifts each person has. And I finish up by saying, create a schedule for the first day, uh, following the above guidelines, perform this step by step while detailing each step, what you did in the way, which is sort of like a wink. Okay. I told you, I don't necessarily use all of the tricks that you saw before or that we reviewed, but here I'm, I'm kind of tapping into this uh, chain of thought. Let's think this step by step. Um, great. At the end, this is the output. Uh, it does actually do everything step by step. Uh, and at the end, the step which I care about is five. And it gives me the final schedule. It tells me how people uh, need to stand guard. And it also at the end ensures that there is a fair distribution of shifts. A very good example. I really urge you to try it at home. Uh, these are some of the, I won't go over them, but these are some of the steps which I tried to write myself as I was correcting the prompt. I went through more than 30 iterations. I changed way more than 30 things, but I wanted to give you a sense of how hard a problem could be and what are the different steps that you need to go through. So let's talk a little bit about the process of creating a prompt. Again, you will not be going into YouTube or Medium and finding the 15 perfect prompts which will just work for you. I do recommend going reading some of these articles, even though they do become a bit repetitive at some point, uh, just to get a general sense. But by no means will you be able to just take those prompts and apply them on a, a scalable production, a robust use case. It requires you to know how to do prompt engineering and to bring some domain knowledge. And it's an iterative process. So let's discuss this iterative process. Great. Prompt engineering. This is how it looks like. Uh, you state your problem. You examine re relevant information. You think about it for a bit. You start by proposing an initial solution. I gave you the example with the guard problem. It was a very bad initial, initial solution, but it's something to iterate upon and adjust. Adjusting the solution it has three high-level steps. You test, you examine the output, and you do some research. Okay, uh, Maybe some things that you know beforehand, Maybe some things that you just didn't think of in the context of this prompt. Uh, and then you rinse and repeat. Uh, as you saw before, rinsing and repeating can take you 30 plus steps, or maybe you'll get it right on the third or fourth try. We've been doing this for nearly, uh, I've been do doing generative AI for almost a year now, uh, previously at Google and now uh, at my own company. But we've been doing this for nearly four months and never have I just flat out written a prompt that worked, didn't need any improvement, didn't need anything better. Uh, it's not to say that some of my prompts aren't relatively good when I just write the initial version, but there's always things that you can make better. Also, I don't discuss this here, but the models, sometimes they change over time. Okay, and there's this whole thing where OpenAI claim that they haven't changed the model and other people are accusing them to have changed the model under the hood. And fortunately or unfortunately, I subscribe to the ones that say, you know, uh, even if you think they don't, you have to account for that. But once you're happy with the prompt and you've tested it out manually a couple of times to see that it gives you the uh, re result you're looking for, uh, your best option is to probably test it at a bit larger scale. Uh, again, we don't go into how to do this because we don't have time in the uh, 10 minutes that we have left. Uh, but in the workshops, we do actually explain how to scale this, uh, how to have your model be tested at scale using other models and some automation. And when you're finally happy, it, you should launch your solution. On the right, you can see an image where um, I took from a, a, a guy named Nabil who has a very uh, good um, um, article about prompt engineering. It's not always that more is better. You have to be very attentive. It's a step-by-step -step process for a reason. Uh, and you have to see that 
the things that you're adding are beneficial and are not taking away. Uh, it's a process and you have to see that you don't go overboard. Great. We have reached the final demo. And now I will show you how to actually write the cold email that I showed you before, step by step to the best of my ability in the five minutes that I want to spend on this demo. A short reminder, some of the color coding uh, techniques that I will use are role, task, uh, engagement, context, uh, so on and so forth. You can see them here on my screen for yourself. My first version of the email is as follows. I simply say, uh, I assign a role. I say, I want you to act as an email marketing expert specializing in cold emails. And your task is to create a cold email that will attract the attention of my ideal customer persona. Uh, I translated this into the format which OpenAI expects to get on the API request. And I'm using the most powerful model to date, which is GPT-4. I run. And the result that I get, I, you know, the models are still not deterministic, but not very good. Okay. And you can see for yourself, it's rather generic with points one to five. And it's a bit chatty. It's saying, sure, I'd be glad to help you craft an email. It's missing things like subject. Uh, it's not actually taking into account what I do. Um, it's not very appealing to the eye. There's no visuals and really no call to action or no ask from the email. I want to make this better, okay? Um, so again, I go and I think and I say, okay, um, let me add some more things. Uh, if I'm working with a chat model such as ChatGPT, I could add some rules of engagement. I say... Ask me questions until you have enough information to perform the task. Uh, I give it more context. I tell it that I'm actually an online sports retailer and I sell stuff. Uh, I say that we sell stuff uh, at a high to a high competitive um, level. And not only do I say high competitive level, I explain. Similar to what I said told you before about the guards allocation where I said divide it equally and then I had to explain what equally means. Here, I say at a high competitive level and then I explain. A high competitive level implies that so on and so forth. Later, I say we work with loyal customers. Then I go on to explain what loyal customers mean. Um, in the task, before I said my ideal customer persona, but I did not specify what my ideal customer persona is. So here I, I specify, I say they're athletes. Um, and lastly, I, I remind the model that uh, we sell sport equipment online, which is a uh, wink to trying to you know make use of the relevancy bias. There are other things which I use here, which are not specifically color coded. You know, I start selling it at the end, the last line you see, make it flashy uh, with emojis. Uh, again, I translated here into uh, what ChatGPT uh, will understand, and I run it. Let's run it again. Much better, much better. Okay, we're making progress. Um, this looks much more appealing. It already has a subject uh, not very chatty. It's not telling me, oh, yes, of course, I can go and write this email for you. It would be my pleasure and honor. No, it's straight up giving me a subject. It's using emojis. It's uh, it's very appealing to the eye. There's a call to action button at uh, uh, lower. And um, generally, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not too displeased with this mail. Uh, it could work. Uh, however, I could make this better. You could make this better. And I go and I look at it and I start to think, okay, what's what's wrong? <clears throat> First of all, it's it's not specific enough. It's just unleash your potential, tailored for champions, uh, no discounts, just value, which maybe I, I don't really want it to say that. Um, it's a bit lengthy. Okay, I don't really feel like going and reading everything. So why, why would my customer really feel like reading this entirety of a, of a mail. 
uh, the subject maybe is is a bit too too lengthy it, it, it kind of looks like an advert um and I go and I think about all these things and and when we work with customers we think about this you know together and we, we do the workshops like how do you take this step and you you move on to the next level now uh, by no means was version three the final version but since we 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 are limited to an hour here. I am jumping a few steps ahead to the final version. And I've added a couple of things. First of all, I add uh, more things to the task. I tell it to keep the email under 10 lines. And I also add a, which is being more specific. And then I tell it, use a tone of a positive, encouraging coach. Again, I'm appealing to athletes. I want to use a tone that they're familiar with. Okay, this is a good style cho choice for me, giving this specific problem. Then in red, I give it the different steps that I want to follow in order to create a mail. And here, uh, I think you should find this interesting. The first step is I'm telling it to actually check my website. Check my website. See see what I'm, I'm selling. Become aware of my catalog, so to speak. Uh, then pick an item from the page. Generate some information about this item to use in an email. Okay, here I'm I'm doing steps in the red and I'm in blue. I'm tapping into the concept that we saw before of uh, knowledge generation. I tell it, generate a photo of the item using DALE 3. And then, and only then, write the mail and incorporate the photo into it. I'm not done yet. I want to give it an example of how it might look. So my desired output is the following. I have a subject line with a title. Hi. And, and I... All of these things in, um, in in brackets is basically a template for the model to uh, adhere, but still be creative, okay? I don't want him to give me this as an output. I want him to use it in order to uh, keep it kind of uh, in, 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 in check, okay? You can think about it as, you know, I'm keeping the model in, in bounds of where I want the end result to be. So here is an example um, with all different things. I'm, I'm telling it to put some content and use emojis and highlight certain uh, specific key features. And at the end, I say, my job depends on how good this email is. Don't be chatty. Give me the output and only the output in the format that I asked for. Some concepts which I've used, um, but not especially that are the concepts that we reviewed before, such as, you know, length, recency bias, explaining, separation, recency bias, and so on. Now, when I run this mail, uh, by the way, if anybody sees the max token and thinks to, my, to themselves, maybe that's what's actually making the mail not long, that's not the reason. It turns out that if you don't specify with GPT-4 Vision the max tokens, it just so happened to only return the first line to me. Um, max tokens 3000 is way more than the length of this mail. Um, if anybody wants the notebook, I'll share the notebook. In the utility section on the top, it actually has a token counting method. So you can know exactly how much each answer, or each prompt that you're uh, using has. Um, great. So this is the response. Way better. Great. Um, I really feel that I could use this. I, I deem this a success. Great. Back to the slides. A few papers. Um, we don't have time, so I won't review them. I've just got just briefly go over the list. Uh, we have Lost in the Middle, which is a very interesting paper uh, about how things that you put in the beginning or the end affect the model's output much more. Uh, another reluctancy to retrieve injections is interesting uh, article from Anthropic where they showcase that they use the entirety of the 200,000 context window uh, and yet they try to inject wrong information, but the model knows the context of the thing around the injected information and exhibits a behavior where it doesn't retrieve the injected information, which is very powerful, very interesting. Uh, take a deep breath from Microsoft, directional stimuli, and and hallucinations in a snowball. All relevant papers. I'm sorry, but due to time sake, we will not go over these. Uh, I will, however, be happy to share them. Uh, we've already seen the guards demo. 
I will talk about briefly about the future of prompt engineering. I think in the near future, we'll have more and more prompts being discovered. Uh, we'll get longer prompts, which are more akin to computer programs. There's a paper on the left here, which tries to already categorize different prompts into uh, analogous computer programs. The prompts will gain more control, will be able to manipulate better using prompt engineering. And also the models will allow to more control, will sort of figure out this prompt uh, bridge between a prompt to its output through the model. And if we're going really far, and that's my personal prediction, I think that 10 years from now, we're, we're not going to have so many R&D people or software engineers and product people are going to be able to do a lot of things just using prompt engineering and platforms like uh, um, Juxio. How to get started. And these are three very good resources I recommend. LearnPrompting.org. Uh, there's a Master the Perfect Prompt YouTube video and Write Expert Prompt on Medium, which is uh, three articles which I really liked. Uh, we also do a hands-up workshop where we go through similar examples to the one of the cold emails that you see here on the right and that we reviewed before. Uh, and we work step-by-step -step on similar examples, really helping you understand how to do prompt engineering. We also go into deep, deeper dive on things like agent, active prompts, what is memory, how it works, and so on and so forth. Thank you everybody for joining. Our next meetup will be in three weeks from now on the 4th of January. Uh, in this meetup, we'll be discussing enterprise Gen AI use cases. Uh, I will make this meetup available uh, as we finish this session. Uh, if we could just do the last poll now, uh, we'd really appreciate if you guys could vote. Uh, we want to make this community valuable. We want to make these sessions valuable to you. Uh, therefore, if you could just take a moment to vote on the next topic, uh, we will try and do the ones that you most care about. Uh, we guys are here for you. And um, I'd like you to thank you all for, for joining. My name is Jonathan. If anybody wants to reach out for me, to me, my email appears on the slide. It's been a pleasure on my part. Thank you all for, for joining. Uh, please like and uh, subscribe, as they say, or rather join our uh, next meetup in three weeks on the 4th of January. Thank you very much, guys.